come eventually. So thank you for being here. Let us join in prayer. Holy God, we are grateful for your presence here with us and all around us, everywhere we look. Creation is amazing. And for that, we are grateful. Help us to turn our hearts and our minds towards you for the next hour. Keep you in our focus in this space. And as we move from here later, keep you in our hearts and in our focus always. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Let's see. All right, you guys want to Welcome to... to meet our general minister and president, Reverend Terry Ford Owens, and to meet uh, some of our Columbia partners and spend some time with them. Uh, on Friday evening of assembly, we will be having a special Big Sky Area dinner with uh, Pablo and uh, Ziomara, who are our Columbia. So it'll be an intimate opportunity for you to visit with them, and, and I'll be there. Um, so. I also have a baptism. We will be celebrating Cambridge West's 40th anniversary this year. And as part of that, 
at the worship service on Sunday of that week, we will be doing baptism at Cambridge West. So think about that for anyone who is contemplating baptism. I know I've got at least one in our congregation that's thinking that direction. So we're going to make some phone calls and see if we can get a little class going for that. But it will be a joint baptism with other churches. So it'll be fun. Other churches in our region. And we will, on that day, we will not have worship here. And don't worry, we'll announce it closer to that. Um, but we will be taking people to Cambridge West to have worship together for the 40th anniversary. So we will be going to camp for worship that day. But that's that's a ways out, but I just wanted to start that thought process going for you and make sure that you have that. If you know anyone who is interested in baptism, let me know, and we will move forward that way. Um, other announcements, we have a board meeting on Tuesday evening, I believe. Okay. Tuesday evening board meeting. And as always, board meetings are open to anyone who would like to attend. Any other announcements that I'm missing? We have we started Revelation, the book of Revelation Bible study. We started that two weeks ago, This, but we will resume at the retreat on Thursday. Um, I think that's it, unless someone else has something. Okay, with that being said, let's sing some more. Oh, wait, sorry, one more. It's a big one. Next week, next Sunday, I invite you to come to worship. We will not be leading worship. There's a group having a revival in our church, and they will be leading worship. I would encourage you all to show up and attend and experience something different. It is, it is a Hispanic-led group that's running the running service, and they are open to us joining them. And that was part of the agreement so they could use this space for four days that we would join their worship service. So I would encourage you to have an open mind and come and celebrate the spirit differently that day. So same time. Same time, 10 a.m. They might be on time where we typically aren't, but we'll see. Um, my understanding is they will be doing baptisms of their own, so that'll be kind of fun for us to see. Um, just come and be open to a different experience. It's all the same God. It's all for God's glory. It's all for God's praise. So come experience something different. If you have questions for me, ask me after worship, um, but we will enjoy being a little challenged and open to something new. Sound good? Yeah. Awesome. Let's sing. For sure this time. <laughs>
cared for us and took care of us. So let's remember our childhood for a minute. I want you all to kind of go back. And I don't know about first memories. Mine is not very young, but how many of you can remember your first bed? How many of you can remember your crib? Okay, some of you can. I cannot remember. I don't know if I had a crib, but I, I can remember um, being in bed. Um, actually with my sister. So I think my first bed was probably shared with a sibling. How many of you shared a bed with a sibling? Yeah, that was, those were important times. I remember waking up and calling mommy, mommy in the middle of the night a lot, and she would answer, and kind of like Mother Mary calls me. I mean, I would call her and she would say what, and then I would be fine. And when I was little, those things, they were just so important. Um, let's see, what else did I write down here? No, this year, your first bed might have had little bunnies or some kind of little animals on it, your first sheet. And you possibly had a favorite stuffed animal that was there for you. I brought mine because I always like to bring a show and tell. So you can see this poor little bear. It doesn't get played with anymore. And I can't remember when I needed it to go to sleep, but we had our little Atlas, he's two, with us last night. And he had to have his Elmo. And when I went in to cover him up, he was cuddling with Elmo. So I just automatically thought of my little bear and the fact that my parents must have made it available to me when I needed it because it's definitely seen some, some love. Um, so let's see, that's what parents do for us. They give us a comfort, they give us safety. Um, that first crib with the tall rails, they made sure we were safe. What else do parents provide that you probably remember? You don't have to go all the way back to when you were a baby in a crib. But any other things you remember your parents providing for you? Guidance. Guidance. This church. Yeah. How about food? Do you remember? I remember waking up hungry sometimes and just knowing in the morning there would be food there. It was just there. It was just there for us. It was provided. And as I got older, education kind of to go along with the guidance and the transportation. That was important during those teen years before we <laughs> even after I learned to drive. It was important. They, they made sure I had something that was safe to drive and um, that I was driving safely. So <clears throat> parents plan ahead for their children, loving them and caring for them before they can even understand the way it works, that that's where, that's why the teddy bear was there because my parents made sure it was there, that it didn't get lost or left behind. Well, our scripture today is going to tell about how God has prepared and loves and cares for us, even when we don't understand the full plan. Let's have a prayer. Holy one, you are our loving parent and we give thanks, especially for all the little surprises of spring that are popping up around us. Yeah. 
This morning's scripture is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 14, and this is from the Women's Lectionary. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of God's grace, grace which God has abundantly poured upon us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has made known to us the mystery of God's will according to God's good pleasure that God set forth in Christ. A plan in the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth, all into, into Christ. In Christ, there is also an inheritance from before, before time according to the purposes of the one who does all things according to God's counsel and will. This so that we might live for the praise of God's glory. We who first trusted in Christ, in Christ you also heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed and were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. She is a deposit in our inheritance toward redemption as God's own possession to the praise of God's glory. That's the reading and the hearing of his word. In her book, Breath of the Soul, Joan Chittister shares a story about a Sufi who made an annual pilgrimage to Mecca. It was a long walk for him and the sun was high. He had come miles without stopping. Finally, in sight of the mosque at Mecca, sure of the goal now, the old man lay down in the road to rest. Suddenly, one of the other pilgrims shook him, rough and harsh in the doing of it. Wake up, he commanded. You blaspheme. You lie in such a way that your feet are ported, pointed towards God in the holy mosque. What kind of Sufi are you? The old Sufi opened one eye, smiled a bit, and said, I thank you, holy sir. Now, if you would be kind enough to turn my feet in some direction where they are not pointed toward God. How often are we the second man in this story? The one who comes along and passes judgment. I know it's not likely to be that the person's feet are pointed in the wrong direction, but how often have we seen and heard people grumbling about someone sitting in their pew or their seat or making a mess in the kitchen or leaving the lights on and the door open? I know I'm guilty of these things, and I suspect each of you is as well. How often do we, like the second man, get caught up in the rules or the traditions of our faith and bemoan the practices of others? Maybe that's just how the Catholics or the evangelicals do things. Maybe it's just the way the progressives or the conservatives do things. Maybe it's just my way versus their way. All the while, we are each guilty of ignoring the bigger picture that Ephesians calls us to. The ideal espoused by our disciples' mission, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. Ephesians calls us to recognize our unity in God over and above our differences here on earth. It opens our passage today with, in Christ, we have redemption. Not have, have. We have redemption, meaning that this is an ongoing work, not a one and done, but that Jesus serves as a continuing source of deliverance for all of us, that our sins are forgiven according to the riches of God's grace. St. Augustine wrote, the God who is inside us 
closer than we are to ourselves is also outside, quite beyond our comprehension. We cannot reach God without God's having come towards us. A commentator, Femi Perkins, writes that Ephesians envisions a different basis for human unity, a religious one. That sounds a bit ironic to me, given that most of our battles and our wars today are fought over some form of religious ideology. But Phoebe writes, as far as one can tell, this realization was unique to the Christian mission. Not even the Romans thought that all citizens of their empire would worship Roman gods. Jews never undertook a systemic policy of proselytism to bring pagans to the worship of God. Ephesians has set Paul's own concern for a mission that would reach the ends of the Roman Empire in a global perspective. God planned to unite all things in Christ even before creation. Perkins goes on to say that Ephesians weaves the function of Christ, Christ as heavenly mediator into the praise of God as benefactor. Ephesians sees redemption as the purpose that God has embedded in creation as a whole. The section today, our reading today, is poetic rhetoric not theological language of dogmatic textbooks. And Perkins says that the nuts and bolts of a theological explanation and vision, they're not provided. But it puts its affirmation of faith into the dramatic sweep of 21st century science and the consequences are breathtaking. Cosmology, our sciences, will not prove the truth about the hidden faith structure of the universe, whether it's dressed up in first century or 21st century garb, but it will instruct us about imagining God. We are summoned to a vision of a God who encompasses the whole cosmos and who is active in all of creation. One of the fundamental tenets of biblical theology is that creation, everything around us, including us, is a witness to God. And that witness calls for human response of praise and of piety, walking in holiness. But Ephesians points to a further movement beyond just awe and praise, that of discipleship. Holiness is a way of life that corresponds to God, to God revealed in all of creation. Joan Chittister in her book, In Search of Belief, puts it this way. By naming God, everything that makes God, God, we come daily to see God differently, to see God holy. More than that, by naming God the sum total of created goodness, we come to see the rest of life differently as well. In the first place, we see God present to every distinct moment, every separate segment of life. In the second place, we come to see every distinct moment of life, every gracious mortal being around us charged with that presence. We come to see every facet of life, all of them, each of them, as glints of the divine. We get a fuller picture of God. At the same time, we get a deeper understanding of the sacredness of a creation that shares in this diversity. Clearly, if God is really God, no one name can possibly hold all the illusions, say all the concepts, breathe in one breath all the qualities that are God. She goes on to say, when we name God fully, all of life becomes an exercise in contemplation. 
We touch the divine dimensions of ourselves. We see God everywhere. We feel divinity everywhere. We recognize God everywhere. And eventually, we become what we think about. We become what we see. We make holy what we touch. We make sacred what we are. We serve us. Turn direction. Where we and to inspire awe, just take a look outside. Sunshine, the flowers beginning to come up from the ground, the of our beautiful little families of deer that hang out in the corners, the mountains that we see around this beautiful community. Ephesians reminds us that before any of this even existed, God's plan encompassed the human story of faith. God is plan. Jesus Christ gives us agency, the ability to join in with God in bringing about redemption and justice here on earth as co-creators, furthering the vision of creation. So Jesus Christ is our agency, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit that we've been given is the guarantee the divine deposit of God's divine graciousness poured out in abundance for us all. An eternal reminder that we are each part of God's precious creation, too. God is present everywhere, and yet it is us who have blinders on. We have received the down payment already. We have received abundance beyond measure. And yet we still lament all that we do not have, still agonize and argue over all of our differences, and still try to reduce God to some controllable image that is on our side. We have received the down payment and shirk the responsibility of following through with the rest of the mortgage. We are the body of Christ. And we are united in our love for a God who first loved us, a God who fit forgave us so that we might learn what it is to forgive others, a God who pours out grace for us even before we have a glimmer of understanding of what grace is or why we need it. We are the body of Christ and truly the best most hopeful response we can offer is a full body praise to our incredible benefactor. Nothing else makes sense in light of what we've already been given. The plan, the agency, and the guarantee, they're already ours. Let us respond in praise, in gratitude, and in action to see our world redeemed. Amen. Let's sing Precious Love.
we enter into our time of prayer for the people. I'll open us in prayer and offer some time for you to say out loud the words on your heart, the joys, the concerns, the celebrations, and the sorrows. Let us pray. God of divine grace, poured out freely for all of us, even before we know we need it. We bring our whole selves to you, even those shadow pieces that we hide from the rest of the world. We know that you see them. We know that you see our struggles and you know that you see those, those joys that we are reluctant to share with others. Help us to speak aloud our joys and concerns so that as the body of Christ, we can support one another just as you support us. For what and for whom do we pray? For the strength and the health of a child born early. Prayers of hope for Beth as she completes her radiation treatment. Continue prayers for my brother John and his family. And continues continued prayers for John and his family. And then prayers for Susie that is having shoulder surgery on the 25th. Prayers for Susie who's having surgery on the 25th, and also prayers for Susie, Stephanie, and Isabel as they make their discernments about this church and their faith and all of the things that are coming together for them. Prayers for 
prayer of thanksgiving for this church and this new partnership with Family Promise. Prayers for this church and the new partnership with Family Promise. There is hope in these wands. Prayer for me since I got bitten by two dogs. Prayer for Christine as she heals from being bitten and adjusts to some of those fears. I would offer prayers for the light of the world as they prepare for their celebration that they will have here in our, in our midst from Thursday to Sunday. Prayers for each of you and for all of us in this congregation that we keep our minds and our hearts open to different ways of being church and to the process of discernment as we move forward and step more fully into who we are and who we can become. Well, first for Karen Taylor's family, yes. I'm not sure they were supposed to have <laughs> their two grandbabies. Yeah, prayers for Karen Taylor and two new grandbabies come arriving, if not already soon. And prayers for Rose and Bonnie and Neva and all those that that um, still hold their church in their hearts but can't be with us physically mm -hmm. here. Prayers for Rose and Neva and all who can't physically be with us but who are present in spirit and still part of this community. Holy wonder. It is such a joy to hear so many voices lifting up prayers, lifting up hopes and dreams, lifting up challenges and sorrows. We know that you, you read our hearts. You know what's written in the pages there. And yet, we also know that prayer said out loud is music to you. And your instruction has always been, make a joyful noise. We appreciate all that you are, and we are grateful for your presence with us. And we thank you for the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
is definitely spring out there. And I think like you, um, and like me, you are probably excited to have that sunshine and all that comes with it. And some of you may have been out planting seeds or plants. Yeah, yeah I have been. And um, you may have noticed the pansies at the entrance of the church. There are a few. I just got anxious and couldn't resist, even though I know the snow will come again. But they are hanging on out there. And um, the I have one that I planted in a little flower pot on my step and the deer have eaten all the leaves off of it, but it's still there and I'm going to watch and see what happens. It'll have to have more plants added to it. Um, I love the pansies, but I really love the perennials and the perennials are popping up everywhere, it seems. I've seen daffodils, tulips, hyacinths, and crocus just in this neighborhood, because we, you know, I've been walking around here. And on Mount Helena, the bitterroot leaves are scattered. There are more than I've seen in a long, long time, just the little, like, little sea anemones now. The leaves are out, yeah. And um, in the flower bed up here, I didn't get up there to check, but I bet that the pop, uh, lilies are starting to pop their little heads up. So perennials, the flowers that seem to have been planted by God for just our enjoyment. I mean, they just pop up. We don't have to worry about them. When the sun starts staying longer each day and the snow melts, they just start growing and blooming before we even have our spades out and um, plans for our garden work. They are the encouragers saying spring is here, everything is prepared. Come out and take in the beauty. Don't miss the miracle. It's a wonder. Even when we know the snow may fly again next week, I think it's Wednesday, um, we have these reminders that it won't last long. And so this communion table is like that. It's the reminder. It's the encourager. Jesus was preparing his disciples for the difficult times that were coming ahead. He was preparing this reminder that we still have today, that we all need God's unconditional love, forgiveness when we have been on the wrong track, the light of Jesus in our darkest moments, and the power of the spirit that pops its head up within us when we have been down. It's all right here in a perennial reminder of Jesus' sacrifice and enduring love. Please affirm with me that all are welcome to Christ. It is our tradition that all are welcome at this table. If you haven't taken communion here before, it is bread, juice. There is juice and gluten free crackers. There is also individual communion at the back, if you prefer to take it that way. But we know that on that night, Jesus sat with his disciples, broke bread with them, shared a meal with them. And at some point, he took bread and he blessed it. This is my body broken for you. This is new life shared with all people. When you eat, Remember me. And he took a cup and he poured wine and he blessed it and he shared it with them. This is blood spill. This is a new hope poured out for all people. Whenever you drink, remember me. Eternal parent, you have been with us through our lives and before. You who have planned and created the wonders of nature and placed it, us within it, we are thankful. We give thanks for the wonder of Jesus and his love that guides us through our most difficult times and our rejoicing. As we share this bread and cup, fill us with your spirit that we may be more forgiving of those who wrong us, more caring to those who don't know or understand more aware of those in need, 
and more eager to share the wonder and the love we experience here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you come forward today, I encourage you to remember there are thousands of different kinds of bread in this world. Almost an infinite number of liquids you can drink. But we have bread and we have juice and we have Christ. Amen. Come and be fed. <laughs> just a minute of stewardship. Uh, this week, I had someone ask me about our offerings now. If she wanted to know 
if things are going to change, if all of our money will be going to mission now that we don't own the building, will I realize that there may seem to be less need. We don't have the bills, the repair bills, the upkeep of the space, but we will still pay our staff, our maintenance, which you wonder, and our musicians, our office administrator. There will also be our tithing to the regional church, the insurance. I don't know how much that is, but I know it's not, it's a lot. Um, internet and Brenda, I know, could add to this list of things that we still are responsible for. But the point is, will we have changes? Yes. And will we still have needs? Yes. The fact that we may have more money to do outreach and mission, that is exciting. But we have much to be thankful for, that's for sure. Please join me in prayer. Giver of all good gifts, we are thankful for the changes that are happening among us. We are reminded that when we allow your spirit to lead, we can go to amazing places. We give thanks for all the gifts and talents shared here through this community. And we pray for your continued guidance as we seek to share the abundance we have with the world in need. Amen. Please join us for our final song. disciples mission we are a movement we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world one more time all together we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world go live it out thank you